um, relationships would be just so wonderful if it weren't for the emotions. But without emotions, they wouldn't be all that wonderful. We, we enjoy emotions, and they also bring us a lot of grief. Um, you see James 4.1 here, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not your passions, your desires, your emotions, things that war within you? And uh, that causes a lot of grief. Um, relationships are fueled by emotion. What draws us into a relationship with other people generally is some kind of pleasure. We enjoy their company, we find them witty, they're entertaining, they're a good hunting buddy, uh, we like cooking with somebody. At some point in life, we start developing a romantic relationship, typically, um, and that's where we can experience both our greatest joy and also our greatest pain, is in our marriages, our families, with our children, with our parents. Um, you look at this picture in front of you, and you think, what, what are the story and the emotions that are suggested by this scene? I want you to take just a couple of minutes with whoever your discussion partner is, and if you had to write a story, if you were assigned an English assignment, you were given this picture, and write a one-paragraph story describing that situation, what would you write? Take a couple minutes and just share with each other what you would put into your story. Okay. I would bet, I would bet, if I actually gave you all a piece of paper and gave you five, ten minutes to actually write out your story. I'm betting that the ladies in the room would come up with much more elaborate stories. <laughs> the guys would say, well, I think their football team lost. <laughs> and they're really sad. As I look at that picture, what I see is two people who are in a lot of pain. And they're in a lot of pain because they really care about each other. And we really care about somebody, we come close, and the closer we get, the more vulnerable we are, and the more we get hurt. I see a couple that has been hurt by something, and it's not the first time. The things that hurt us the most is when it's happened again and again and again. First time, you can say, well, he didn't know. Second time, well, he forgot. Third time, fourth time, fifth time, he just doesn't care. It's the repeated hurts that hurt a lot. I see two people that want to be close, but something's come between them that's caused a great division and a lot of pain, and they want to be close again. The wall sort of represents this, this division, this separation, yet they're reaching around it, they're touching. They want to be close. I see in that that he reached around first. His hand was there first. He initiated. She reached around second. She responded. They want to be close again, but they're afraid. And that's what emotions do. Our, our, our desire for the joy of emotion and intimacy draws us toward each other, and yet the pain of disappointment and rejection and all those things pushes us apart. Relationships are challenging because they're fueled by emotions. Now, emotions are something given to us by God. They're not the result of a fall. They are twisted by the fall, but they're not the result of the fall. We weren't purely intellectual creatures before Eve ate the apple. Um, we don't have a lot of information in Scripture about emotions before the fall. I, I'm not a Hebrew student, but my understanding is when God made Eve and brought Eve to Adam, that the Hebrew there does seem to imply some emotion, like, wow, there's some pleasure. Uh, he sees her, he's attracted to her. But the fall has certainly caused some problems. Emotions are built into all people. Everyone on the face of the earth has an emotional capacity. And they are, they are actually physiological, part of them. There's, there's more to them, I'm sure, than this. But they are partly physiological experiences that involve measurable neural brain changes, um, muscular changes. When we're angry, we're uptight, you can feel your, your gut clench up, your muscles tense up. Um, hormonal, there's certain emotions that when they're triggered, your body is just infused with certain hormones, adrenaline, dopamine, oxytocin, vasopressin. There's all sorts of, of hormones directly related to our, emotion, uh, our emotions. And even our heart, you can feel your heart beating. I was having a very difficult time with a number of things yesterday, and I was just, I'm trying to learn to really read my body. And my, my heart was just going boom, 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 boom. Would not have been a good time for someone to do something that would irritate me. I mean, it was building up, you know, just some tension. 
Um, and these are all changes that impact our thinking, how we view things, how we interpret things, and they move us to action. The very word, the root word, emotion, means to move, to move. And that's very much what our emotions do. They move us to action. Now, even the emotion of anger in, it, in its pure, appropriate, godly form, um, anger can be a righteous emotion. We see something wrong. We see um, people kidnapped and, and put into the, to, to the sex trade. We should be angry about that. We should move into action and do something to stop it and not be casual about it. So there's a righteous anger we can have when we see sin, but too often our anger is not at sin out there, it's someone who's crossed us, thwarted our agenda, our preferences. Now, emotions provide some of the greatest pleasures in life, and these are things that you know, we often call it, you know, love, joy, delight, acceptance, a sense of belonging, peace, worship, all these different things that are, are wonderful things we experience. We're drawn towards situations that give us that joy. I know guys that spend days and days in the mountains hunting in the fall. It, it is not simply they've done the economics and they figure this is a good way to bring in meat for the year economically. In fact, you add it all up. <laughs> Very expensive meat. It's the pleasure. It's being out there. It's the chase. It's running down that big elk. That's an emotion. Um, and their wives are back in town having the same experience over at the women's store here. They're running that new dress down, conquering. But there's also negative emotions in life that bring us pain and agony. And these are things like sadness and embarrassment, anger, bitterness, jealousy, self-pity, regret. And those are things that make life difficult for us. Now, what's interesting is you look at Holy Scripture, you see that Jesus experienced a wide range of emotions. Now, I want to acknowledge there is a real age-old controversy over this whole issue of does God feel emotions? Um, the, the, it's called the passivity of God. Or, um, and the, the idea that it, is God moved by emotions the way we are? Absolutely not. Emotions never take God by surprise. They never overwhelm him and get him to do something. Afterwards, he goes, oh, why did I do that? That's never attributed to God, um, nor to Jesus. And yet we do see Scripture describing Jesus experiencing love, compassion, joy, pity, sorrow, and agony. And that last one, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, was trying to move him. In a natural human being, it would have sent him right out the other side of the Garden of Gethsemane, away from Jerusalem. That's what the emotion would have moved the normal human being, but because of his great love. And that he was never ruled by his emotions. He ruled his emotions. He went up that hill to Jerusalem and he died for our sins. So he was never surprised. He was never overwhelmed. He was never moved to act contrary to his father's will. I wish I could say the same about us. It's not always true. Because of the fall, sin has corrupted our whole being. It's corrupted our mind. We don't always think right. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we, we have great insights in, into, into creation and nature and people and politics and justice and righteousness. And other times we don't think right. Sometimes we feel right. We have compassion. We have concern. We do ministry. But other times our emotions are twisted and they, they lead us astray. I'm sure just about everyone in this room has had an experience of in just a moment of intense emotion you say something and the period's not even on the sentence before you wish you could take it back. The words are out of your mouth. I did this the other day. My little two-year-old is at the, my, my two-year-old grandson is at the age of um, just totally exploring his world. I mean, he just, he wants to get into everything. And to me, I have to keep reminding myself, this is programmed into, he's like a Mars uh, rover. God makes the little mind when he says, take dominion of the earth that it may bud and flourish and produce. He, he, he made the human mind hungry for data. And it's like the Mars rover. He's going all over Mars, opening this cabinet and pulling out this drawer. And his, his thing right now is anything that's liquid, like lotion or sunscreen or anything, as he gets it out all over him and all over the mirror and all over the counter. And I came in the other day, and he'd just gotten into all of um, uh, my daughter's stuff, and he was a mess. The bathroom was a mess. And in just a moment of anger, I said, Andrew! You shouldn't be in there. And the minute I said it, I thought, oh, I was so wrong. And he looked up at me and he just started to cry. 
But it was this moment of anger where my emotions moved me to say something and do something I instantly regretted. And I had to hug him and get all covered with ooze and goo and stuff to make it up to him. (laughs) But it's not only corrupted our mind, it's corrupted our emotions, it's corrupted our will. Paul talks about in, in Romans 7, he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. And there's both a spiritual thing going on there, it is sin, and, and somewhere, I don't understand, I, I do not have the answer to this, but there, there's an interface between the spiritual but even the neurological. We, we can now understand much more, even how habits are formed and addictions are formed, that you, you want to quit eating all the bad food, you want to exercise, you want to lose weight, you've got these great goals, and yet every day, poof, they, they can measure parts of the brain that aren't processing those desires, and those goals, and those passions properly. And so there's something where our mind has been twisted, our will has been twisted, and we don't always do the things we want. It's like Paul said. I I would give you this analogy. Some years ago, I had a computer that sometimes worked really wonderfully. It was a great little laptop computer. It was great. But once in a while, man, it just went crazy. It, it, It would just shut down. I'd hit keys. Nothing would happen. That is so aggravating. And I had a technician look at it a few times, everything else, we couldn't figure out what it was. Finally, he pulled out a magnifying glass and he looked at the motherboard and he saw this teeny little crack at just one place where there was a circuit that under normal condition, the two parts of the metal circuit were touching and it worked well, but if the, if the computer got sort of warm and things expanded, that little circuit was broken and it didn't work. Well, when the heat of living in a fallen world does this, our motherboard doesn't always work right. And we we get angry, we get bitter, we get jealous, we get defensive, we get all these things don't work right. And so our emotions can sometimes give us great joy and help help us to do wonderful, good, noble things. And sometimes they lead us down a road we have deep regrets about. I think about all the divorce cases. I've handled 600 divorce cases, mediations, and many of them involving infidelity, adultery. And the grief and the pain and the regret people have for that moment of indiscretion, that moment of seeking pleasure as David did with Bathsheba, and the lifetime regret they have because of that, because that lust overtook them for a moment, drove them to do things that they later regretted. So the bottom line here is that positive emotions usually move us to do good things, but these negative emotions, the ones twisted by the fall, often move us to sin against God and one another. You see in Genesis 37, a classic example, Joseph's brothers were so jealous of him, they sold him into slavery. I'd love to know how many nights did Judah and Reuben and Benjamin, not Benjamin, he was innocent, but the other brothers lay on their mats in their tents, regretting, feeling guilty about the horrible thing they did to their brother. It was too late to take it back. We see in 2 Samuel 11, the whole story of David and Bathsheba. Sexual lust causes so much damage. Psalm 37 or 73 there in your study guide captures it so well. I said, my soul was embittered. I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Emotions out of control, twisted by the fall, can turn us into animals. We act like animals. Now, On the next page, you see a chart of some of the emotions that humans are capable of experiencing. This is just a fraction of the words in the English language that describe human emotions. <laughs> the list is a legion. I've seen emotions organized under three core concepts, five. I've given you seven just to sort of spread them out a bit. And you see things like sadness. There's a whole bunch of terms that describe either moderate sadness to very intense sadness. I've got shame and fear. Those are three sort of on the left. You've got in the middle sort of the enjoyment and, and love emotions. And then you've got surprise, disgust, and anger on the right. It's interesting, once I sort of organized this, one of the people that we trained uh, brought my, to my attention that these groupings sort of, you know, you've got these ones that are sort of the negative, the fearful ones. And he thought of the passage in 2 Timothy 1 through 7, God did not give us a spirit of fear. He doesn't want us being ruled by sadness, shame, and fear. But he's given us a spirit of power and love and self-control. That's the spirit he's given to us we can appropriate and live by. And we also want to try to avoid over here on the right those things that precipitate anger, to lash out at people. The spirit of fear causes us to pull away from people, basically, to escape from relationships, to get out of those situations. 
and the emotions on the right tend to cause us sometimes to engage people in an aggressive way, and the Bible warns us again and again to avoid this, this spirit of anger. So the Bible talks a lot about emotions. It has narratives where people's lives are driven by emotion for good or for bad, and has many didactic teachings, many causative principles that talk about how to control and channel our emotions. Um, after this seminar, I would just encourage you to do a little exercise, go to that list and just check off every one of the emotions there that you can recall at some point feeling. And you'll be surprised, the array of emotions you've felt in your life. Now, here's, here's the key point I'm trying to make here. Most of us feel lots of emotions every day, but we haven't learned to read them. Say, now, why, what am I feeling right now? Boy, that's, I think that's jealousy. What am I jealous about? Well, my boss commended the new kid's idea more than me. I used to be the one that had all the praise, and I'm, I may be losing my special spot, and uh, boy, I'm tempted to sort of put this guy down, start talking against him. If you don't identify the emotion, it's going to start driving you. It's going to cause you to do things you really don't want to do. Um, so identifying emotions and then learning how to control them is important. In high-stress situations, the part of the brain that controls our emotions, it's, it's the limbic system, basically, um, will begin to take control, and the limbic system is right on top of the spinal co code when, cord. When the nerves come in with all of our senses from the eyes and ears and touch and everything else, they come in through a gate, through a door, basically, and they come in through the limbic system where all the emotions are embedded, the amygdala and the thalamus and the hippocampus, and that's where a lot of our emotions, the fight-flight type thing, you know, that you see a snake, you don't react in a thoughtful, deliberate way to a rattlesnake when you're walking along a trail. You go, hmm, rattlesnake. Yeah, they're indigenous, this part of the uh, United States, and one that long probably has about, you know, three centimeter or milliliters of venom, and if he strikes me, it could really hurt me, so I probably should move away from him. You don't do that. You just go, snake, and you jump. And that's part of our brain, which is the fight flight, the amygdala, where you just have to react very quickly to something. And that's part of God's defense mechanism that we have on how to deal with a world that has certain threats. But the trouble is, sometimes the, those, those emotions, they, react, they cause us to react quickly without thinking when thinking would have saved us greater grief. For example, using the snake analogy, if my wife Corlette was walking on a steep trail in the mountains, there was a thousand foot sheer cliff over here and a little ledge up here, and she came along and she saw a snake up here, even just a little six inch garter snake, she would jump seven feet out to the left into thin air and just in a reaction to the snake before she would think, oops. <laughs> And we, we sometimes have these quick emotional reactions to things because we don't take the time to think, and we, we, we're in danger then. There's fascinating things going on in the brain. I, I have just in the last couple of years begun to study the brain. And I want to challenge you, especially you who are headed for past, or in pastoral ministry, headed for pastoral ministry. When a pastor steps into the pulpit on Sunday, one of the main things we are trying to do is to affect the way people relate to God and the way they relate to one another. And a huge part of that relationship with God and the other people around it is channeled through the human brain. And I'm finding that most of the leaders in the church today have not spent 10 minutes studying this organ. They don't know what a limbic system is. They've, never, they've heard of maybe the amygdala, but they think it's something down here in your knee or something. Um, they know nothing. And I want to challenge you, God gave us a brain. God gave us emotions. God gave us a will. He gave us all this capacity, and he wants us not to just take dominion of the world out there. He wants us to take dominion of ourselves. He wants us to understand our own brains, our own emotions, how they work, how we can control them, how we can channel them. Now, there's mysteries here I can't explain. There's spiritual things, there's neurological things. I'm trying to figure, where do they dovetail? I don't know. There's a connection there somewhere. But I'm learning some things about what makes me tick. I'm, more, I'm learning about how when I get angry or frustrated, there are chemical things going on inside of my body. When you have a lot of little frustrations during the day, there's a chemical release in your body. It's a combination of adrenaline and cortisone. And it's a combination, and it, it builds tension in your body. Just a little bit, just a little bit. But it's got a long half-life. Um, 
a coworker forgets to give you a report they promise. Whoop, comes up a little bit. But then it takes about two hours to drop off. And maybe 30 minutes later, your secretary loses a file. Whoop, it takes a little while. Well, it starts building on each other. And they can measure in the human body how this chemical starts building up in your system and building up in your system and building up in your system. And at the end of the day, the guy comes home and his little boy does some little thing and dad just explodes at the kid in a very disproportionate way. Now, there is sin there, yes, but it's not just a floating kind of sin. Something physically, because our bodies are also twisted by the fall, something in that man's body has built up and built up and built up, and he hasn't recognized it. He doesn't know that it's there. He hasn't learned to pay attention, and he comes home, and he dumps on the first person who crosses him, and in this case, a little five-year-old boy. We've seen it. Maybe most of us have done it. We need to learn it. I give you a diagram, just a very simple diagram, describing what goes on in the human brain when emotions become intense. Um, our senses are fed in through the thalamus. That's a part right down on top of the spinal cord. That receives the initial information. It sends out a signal to the amygdala. The amygdala is like a, an emotional filing cabinet in the brain. Every experience you have in life, every major experience, has a little folder in the amygdala, this experience, and there's a tag on it, a visit to Disneyland. Oh, what a wonderful, positive thing. I want to take my kids back. Unless your visit to Disneyland is when you came down with the flu and we're just so sick you want to die. Then when someone mentions Disneyland, you go, ugh, I don't want Disneyland. We have experiences, thousands of experiences that have emotional labels attached to them. And they're filed in the amygdala. And God gave us that because we can, we can respond to things quickly, sometimes based on an emotion that that was dangerous, that was bad, that wasn't helpful, get away. You see a pornographic magazine, ooh, I'm not even going to think about it. Just get away. It's dangerous. And so there's a place for that. And eventually, the amygdala can get us to do things quickly, can speak quickly, run quickly, and that can be helpful. Sometimes it's not. Uh, these, these sensations and signals work up through the hippocampus. That's where you get a little bit more processing, a little bit more thinking. And eventually, information gets up to the neocortex. That's where your reasoning is. That's a big part of transforming the human mind as we think God's thoughts after him. We, we embrace his principles of justice and righteousness and kindness. And as we look at a situation, we might have emotions causing us to say, man, I want to get back at her. But we, we remember God's teaching that love your enemy. Be kind to others as God is kind to you. And that takes place in your neocortex. That's where you learn to override the emotional, the sinful thing, and you do the right thing even though you don't feel like doing it. So that's the whole process. Here's the rub. Information gets to the neocortex, or it gets to the amygdala twice as fast as it gets to the neocortex. You can actually measure the circuitry. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's nanoseconds, but it's long enough where you can get an emotional response to something before you have a chance to think about it and pray about it. And that's where you do something you really regret. I did this the other day to my deep regret. Um, someone dear to me had to put two horses down. And this person loves horses. And I knew this would be very hard. So he was already emotionally, deeply distressed that day. And I knew that I was out there to help and comfort and everything else. But I also saw that day that this friend has, has got um, some serious health issues that have already impaired some of his, his capacity to think clearly and all this stress compounded it. And as we came out of the field where the horses were now laying in a grave, um, I saw that he was not capable of driving very well. And I was concerned that he was still on the road sometimes. And so the next day I went out there to talk to him and try to persuade him to give up his driver's license. It was an absolutely stupid and insensitive thing to do. He'd lost two horses the day before. He was still feeling the emotional pain from that. And I go out and say, I'm a, I think you need to give up something else. Now, it was the right thing to do. He does need to stop driving. There's no question. The whole family knows that. But to do it the very next day was incredibly insensitive of me. And I regret it. I wish I hadn't done it. But my emotions, my fear that he was going to be on the road and hurt somebody overrode my thinking to say, no, hold it. Waiting a couple days is not going to make all the difference. He's not going anywhere, anywhere. So we need to understand how these things work in our minds so we can control them. There's two examples here on this page six of, of people being overwhelmed by emotions. Cain, rising up against his brother Abel, killing him. 
I'm sure Cain, the rest of his life, regretted that impulsive act. And we see another one, even in many ways more shocking, Peter, who had told Jesus, wherever you go, I'm with you, Lord, I'll die with you. And yet, when Jesus is arrested, they come and say, hey, you're with him, aren't you? They even, give him, you know, they even take the initiative to invite him to make this profession. He says, no, I don't even know him. And he went outside, and moments later, he was weeping, regretting this emotional reaction. Thank God that he is a forgiving God, and he forgave Peter, restored him, and used him. On page 7, you'll see a description of some of the... Um, uh, dynamics of human emotions. And this is just a small little sample of what goes on inside of us. Um, in fact, before I do that, I want to, there's a film clip I want to show. I get behind. I want to show you an example of how um, emotions can hijack rational thinking. This clip is out of a movie. It's based on a true story about a couple whose little boy wandered off into the woods, three or four five years old, little boy who was not capable of being safe on his own, wanders off into the woods. He's lost. He's out there. It's a dangerous place. There's ponds. There's old wells. There's animals. I mean, this couple has every reason to be really afraid. They've, they've called the police. They've called their neighbors. Everyone's looking for the little boy. I mean, this should be a time of, man, totally, we are together. We are focused. We're going to find our son. Watch what emotions do to their judgment at a crisis time. Was that the time to have that discussion? Okay. Take, the, take a minute. Talk with each other, your discussion partner. What emotions did you observe, and how did these emotions hijack the couple's thinking and actions? Discuss that for a moment, those two questions. Okay. Let me share with you what I see there. On the surface, you certainly see fear. They're concerned for their little boy's safety, natural, natural response. Then the, the mother sees the Christmas lights up there, and she's unhappy about that. And he's going, this is what you're concerned about right now? So, so there's a judgmental, sort of an angry thing at him. And then she gets angry and starts talking about, you know, he's never doing things. You know, if he'd just done what she said, they wouldn't be in this mess. And he's always working. And hold it, I work around here to, you know, take care of this family and all this stuff. What I see, first of all, is a discussion. This isn't the first time they've discussed these issues. <laughs> These are ripe issues. They've probably gone over and over and over again. The other thing that I see here is a very important insight into anger. What comes across to us as anger, what looks like anger, smells like anger, tastes like anger, sounds like anger, is often fear. When people are afraid, they often communicate their fear in a way that looks like anger. And I, it took me years to learn that in my marriage. When, when Corlette was concerned about something, and it usually had to do with our children. She's a loving, caring mother. And when there's something going on there and she was concerned about it and there's, it started to move across from concern into fear and she came to me and we had a discussion, it often sounded like she was mad at me, that she was angry at me. Now, sometimes she was because I'd blown it. I'd, I'd failed to do something. But often it wasn't because I'd done anything wrong, but... It just, it, it sounded like anger. And what my response would be is, well, hold it, why are you angry at me? That's not fair, I didn't do this. And I'm coming back to her, not in a way that ministers to her and addresses the issue, but actually now heightens it up. It ramps it up even higher. Now there is anger. Um, and what we need to realize that emotions, what we see on the surface is not always an accurate representation of what's going on in the heart. And we have to learn this capacity to step back and say, What's really going on here? We call this other awareness. How well do we read other people and interpret their emotions? So there's anger, there's fear, there's resentment, there's a, probably unforgiveness here. They've probably had this discussion. They've probably admitted some failures, and yet they've bl brought it back up again. You're probably seeing here a pretty good representation of what goes on many men, where he says, you know, I work hard to put bread on the table, you know. The reason a lot of men go and work hard to the office is because they can have success at the office. They can go in the office, they can sell that contract, they can build the building, they can, what they set out to do, they can do. They come home and work with a wife and children, man, they may have failure day after day after day. The reason a lot of men and women run to the office, spend all the time there, is they can succeed at the office, and at home they feel like they just keep failing over and over and over. 
So that's probably part of this as well. And what you see here is these emotions, fear, anger, rejection, failure, etc. they totally eclipse rational thinking at this moment when they should be working very closely together to save their son and have this discussion later, maybe with their pastor. Instead, they just dump it all out there. And that's what happens a lot with emotions. It's called hijacking is the term that psychologists use, and I think it's an apt word. It, and not only does our emo- can our emotions hijack our um, our brain, but then they got the whole body along with it. <laughs> our mouth, our hands, our feet, everything else can be taken along with it. And on page seven, you see just a, a detailed description of how this, this whole thing can spiral downward um, from what we call hijacking. And there's another term even more intense called flooding. Hijacking is where the amygdala, the emotions override rational thinking. Flooding is where there's this incessant emotion just coming like wave after wave after wave and it just sort of drowns us. And we just go, whoa, I cannot take all the emotion around here. I'm out of here. And we, just as you run from a flood coming up, you know, your, uh, the front of your house, we run eventually from floods of intense emotion. And here's, here's the typical scenario. Um, you've got, in, in a biblical sense, you can put it in these terms, James 4, 1 through 3 sort of describes this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet. You quarrel and fight. And you ask with wrong motives. I mean, it's a deep description of what's going on in the heart and how it's manifested in our behavior. And it, it often starts off, interestingly in James, the word he uses here, your desires or your passions, it's not the, the Greek word that it talks about inherently sinful or inherently wicked desires. It's a neutral term. It could be actually good desires, but good desires that begin to control us and consume us, the move from being just a desire to a demand can become very sinful things. They can drive us to do bad things. Good goods make bad gods. And if there's some good thing you want, but you want it so much that you get bitter at people who are standing in your way, you, you have to have this thing and you start to judge people who are keeping you from getting it. And if you start judging people, it's only a matter of time before you begin to punish people. So we have a desire, it can grow to the point of a demand, and then it, be, it moves us to start judging those who are opposing us, you know, not allowing us to get this desire, and pretty soon we are punishing. Simple example, uh, uh, a, a young woman might, might want to um, be married or have a baby, and that's a good desire. It's a natural desire God's put into the human heart. But if, if she doesn't get that desire, let's say she's married, she has no children, and she starts to blame her husband, and, and, and he's not attentive, he's not cooperating, he's not going to the doctor, he's not doing the tests, and all this anger comes up, and she begins to judge him and punish him. And it might be either verbally coming at him or maybe withholding affection, maybe pulling away from him. There's lots of ways that we punish each other. You've probably all heard the term or the expression, when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. It's not just mamas, it's daddies and kids. I mean, a little three-year-old can have that same effect. When people aren't happy, we send out vibes. We send out vibes. Now, I think, I do believe women have a particularly powerful ability to do that as the ones who really set the tone and can set the nurturing tone in a home. A woman can send out a lot of vibes. I ain't happy, and until things get back where I want it, I'm going to send out vibes. And everyone is going, whoa. But fathers can do it, kids can do it, we all can do it. But it's a powerful capacity we have to send a message and even to inflict pain on people if we're not getting what we want. And we all have that ability to do it. Let me talk about it more specifically. Let's use some other terminology. There's things that trigger this downward spiral. It might be some poor communication, a misunderstanding, some conflicting agendas. Where we're going to go on vacation, are we going to save money, are we going to buy a used car? Any kind of issue can trigger it. There could be a defensive reaction to criticism. Well, you don't manage very, money very well. Uh, we made some commitments on this, and you didn't keep them. So there's some criticism. And we get defensive. We don't like to be criticized. So we, we respond to that often with sarcasm, anger, yelling, silence, blaming. There's these reflex emotional things we do that don't help. They're just like, here, let me throw a little gasoline on the fire. <laughs> Up go the flames. We begin to see ourselves as the innocent and unappreciated victim. Boy, if my family only knew how much I worked around here. I mean, even that video clip. You know, I work hard every day providing for my kids. 
And so we, we, got, we start seeing ourselves as the innocent, unappreciated victim. We develop a critical spirit and we start to interpret everything the other person does in a critical way. See, there it is again. See, there it is again. I told you, that's how he is. See, there it is again. And not only that, when there's some good thing the person does that would actually be some redeeming thing, we just push it aside. No, we don't even see it, don't acknowledge it, don't remember it. We, we become like Velcro for critical things and Teflon on anything that's good. The good things, they're gone. Velcro, oh man, I remember six years ago on July 17th, three o'clock in the afternoon when you did this. It's amazing how we can remember those things. Um, we start grabbing all the evidence that supports our view. We ignore all the evidence that doesn't. And it begins to put that other person into an absolute lose-lose situation. No matter what they do, they, they, they are just, they're toast. Once they're on your bad list, everything they do is going to be interpreted in a way that keeps them on that list. Now, what's going on inside of us while they do this? You can, you can actually study this. As you feel prolonged negative emotions, it starts to affect you physically. The Bible talks about it wasting a man's bones. And I don't think that's just a spiritual metaphor. I think it affects physic- physically. They say that stress aggravates cancer. There's a lot of things we're finding out aggravate physical ailments. Tension, uh, stress can, can aggravate heart disease precipitate heart attacks, Uh, our muscles tighten up, our pulse goes faster, our breathing is more intense, there's hormones rushing through our body that are there for emergencies, not for steady state. Adrenaline is great for emergencies, it is lousy for steady state. If you've got a high level of adrenaline all the time, it's like afterburner on a jet. You have this intense energy being expended all the time and it will kill you. It will literally kill, there's a great book out there, Adrenaline and Stress. So emotions trigger physical things that can actually physically harm us. But especially what's happening is, it's like on your computer. You've, I've, got a, I've got a central processing unit, a CPU, a microchip on my computer, and they keep getting faster and faster and faster and, and more and more um, complex, and that's why the companies keep wanting to sell you the next generation, because it's twice as fast as the last one. But as fast as they are, they do have a limit. And as you get bigger and bigger programs on here that use up that CPU, I've got some programs on here when they're running, I can't do anything else. When my virus check is going in the evening, I just have to walk away, get a cup of coffee, watch a show. I, I'm not going to get any work done on this computer. That's what happens in our brains. When our brains get intensely overwhelmed by emotions, it is using up so much of our brain capacity, we can't think clearly anymore. And I've experienced that. I just said, Listen, I can't, I can't talk right now. I can't, I've got to go for a walk. I've just got to whew, calm down. I've got to get out there because the emotions is taking up so much of our brain capacity. We cannot think clearly. Um, it becomes difficult to recover from pain, from, from anger, from hurt. Um, we lose hope. We develop a hard, uncaring heart. I've done divorces in situations I could not believe the hardness of heart of people who at one time had been passionately in love with each other, had conceived children together, wanted to spend the rest of their life together, and they just now sit in my room and they are, it's like they have no heart whatsoever. It's scary. It's scary to see a hard heart, especially towards someone that used to be the object of love. And what happens is we begin to avoid that person, pull away, and eventually we give up on that relationship. We give up on the relative, the job, the marriage. It's just this downward spiral goes on and on. And it, part of what goes on here can be this, this flooding, this wave of emotion that just sort of overtakes us again and again and again. I want to show you um, a video clip here of this. This is from a movie called Fireproof. Many of you have probably seen it. Uh, this is a couple whose marriage is going downhill big time. <coughs> a simple principle. As emotions intensify, reasoning goes down. And part of it's just simple neurology, physiology. You just have so much capacity to handle things. Now, there's disciplines we develop early in life. There's spiritual disciplines. There's ways of thinking. There's ways of managing our emotions, our thoughts, our agendas, our desires. We can learn as spiritual disciplines that serve us well at times like this. But if we have not learned those disciplines, this wave of emotion comes over us and we're just swept away by it. Did you hear how he was the innocent victim? I'm out there saving people and doing these things. We see ourselves as victims, we justify ourselves, we attack the other person. It's terrible. 
Now, generally speaking, there, there's some patterns here that go on typically in men and women. And I've, I've seen typical patterns and I've seen them completely reversed. So they're not locked into genders, but there are some general patterns. My general experience has been that men tend to want to avoid conflict. Part of that is we live in a culture that does not prepare men very well to deal with emotion. We do not prepare men in America to deal well with emotion. Early on, what do we say to the little boy? Big boys don't cry. Big boys are tough. Man up, be tough. There's studies done on how people parent. Little girl babies and little girl infants are cuddled more, they are held more, they, they have more conversation about emotions with their parents, both fathers and mothers. Little boys at an early age don't have the physical contact, they don't have the verbal engagement, they don't have the vocabulary. We do not teach men in this country how to deal with emotions very well. And because they don't know, it's like a guy who doesn't know how to golf, he's not going to want to go golfing. If a man doesn't know how to deal with emotions, he's not going to want to get into that ring with all those emotions. He's going to try to get out of there. So men tend to recoil and withdraw and run away. Women tend to want to engage. The most frightening words to many men is, we need to talk. <laughs> that is like, oh no. Uh, gee, I'd love to, but I've got to get down to the office. See you later. Those are scary words to a lot of men. We need to talk. Um, because often it doesn't mean we need to talk. It's, I've got some things to say and you need to listen. <laughs> and that's very scary. Um, fear of flooding. When, when a man feels all this emotion coming at him, it often compels men to stonewall. They either get stoic or they just get out of there. And you push them long enough, push them hard enough, then you see the explosion and it comes back as you saw in that scene. The more a woman presses in, the more many men will pull away. This is why the repeated references in the book of Proverbs, better to live on the corner of a house than with a chorus of moi wife, like a constant dripping on a rainy day as living with a quarrelsome wife. The, the criticism, the, the expressions of dissatisfaction, all these things that keep coming from their spouse can just cause all sorts of fear and withdrawal. Um, now, the, the more this builds, the more, the more man pulls away, the more frustrating she gets, the, the more it just spirals downwards. And you end up with what I would call a threefold failure. Um, you end up with a failure where we don't understand God and how he designed us to be, so we don't engage God properly. We don't understand ourselves, our own emotions. We're not reading ourselves and manage them well. And we're not understanding the other person and engaging and understanding them in a constructive way either. So it's a threefold failure. We're not engaging God. We're not engaging ourselves. We're not engaging other people wisely. And what it ends up with, as these emotions rule us, it's like there's this invisible puppeteer behind us up there with strings on us. Oh yeah, you did that, well I did this, and you did this, and yeah, it's your fault, and everything else, and we're saying things that in a clear-headed moment we would never say. But there's this invisible puppeteer. We've all experienced it at times. Justin's coming to rescue me. Come on up. Come on. Woo. Controls the whole world from his iPad. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so there's a threefold failure. It leaves us vulnerable to being just jerked around by our emotions, our sinful passions, our selfish desires. We say and do things that hurt a lot of relationships. They grieve the heart of God. And of course, they destroy our witness to other people. How can we hold forth a God of love, compassion, self control, selflessness, service, etc., when we ourselves are living? slaves to our emotions and passions. So that's the bad news. The good news is, and from this session on, we're going to start building on this, God has given us a way to understand these things that drive us, the sinful desires and passions that rule us at times, to both discern what's going on, to look at ourselves and say, okay, I think I know what's happening here now. I know why I feel that way. Why is my gut tight right now? Because this is happening, that's an emotional, physical response to this outside situation that I'm interpreting in this way, and here's how God wants me to interpret. We can get better at that. And in the next section this evening, tonight, we're going to lay out a way, of basically a discipleship paradigm, a way of building God's disciplines into your lives to manage these things 
in a constructive way that you're relating constructively to God in a way that he is well pleased with, in a way that you are reading and managing and mastering yourself, the self-disciplined person, in a way that you're looking at people around you, and even if they're coming at you with something that looks like anger, you'll see it as fear, as concern, as, as some need, and you're going to just, the anger's not going to trigger you. You're just going to say, hey, I love you. Let's sit down and talk. Let's engage. You can develop that capacity. So come back tonight. We'll dig into that. Thank you.